Welcome back to the Social Seller Podcast with Connor Paulson, where we interview the world's highest quality communicators, professionals, business owners, creatives, and everything in between. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, if you're a high quality communicator, there's a good chance you're living a lot happier life, but you're also bringing those opportunities into your life almost like a magnet. My guarantee is that on this show, we only interview people that I, one, look up to, and two, that I know are gonna continue to kill the game for years to come, and I wanna make sure they're on your radar. But what I've learned is by asking the best questions, we get the best responses, and that's what the highest quality communicators, our social sellers, are all about. Let's hop inside to the Social Seller Podcast. Welcome back to another Social Seller episode with Connor Paulson. Today, we don't need much of an intro because this is a good friend co-founder, president, CEO of OmniLife, Dalton Shaw. Now, not only have we known each other in similar backgrounds coming from small town Iowa and wanting to do big things, so to speak, and I'm going to keep it broad, you've done some incredible things, things that I've, I continue to look up to. You're a role model to many, including myself. You're a Forbes 30 under 30 recipient. Uh, like I said, co-founder at OmniLife, and that's an organ transplant procurement company as far as I remember that could subtly change, but this is really cool. We're going to dive in. You're a former D1 athlete. You've also experienced an NDE, a near-death experience. And I want to talk about what that is because less than 1%, I think, of the world is able to speak on that. And then you're heavily networked in hospitals, you know, from you know surgeons around the country, North America, around the world, to administrators and as social sellers, and we had a brief conversation about this before, and, and I know that was a, a big point that we want to discuss is why social selling means so much to both you and me. Dalton, thank you for being on The Social Seller, and I want to hop right in. What does social selling mean to you? <clears throat> well, I think uh, a lot of people think selling and values and being... Um, I guess there's two trains of thought. There's, there's one train of thought that says, you know, selling is a numbers game. Um, and, uh, and it's, and it's values and profitability. Uh, when you think about growing a company or growing revenue in a company and selling product, <clears throat> those things are either in inverse related. And then there's another train of thought that, you know, and I think it's kind of, you know, what was sale, what sales was and what sales is today, it, you know, used to be used to have this, uh, uh, there used to be more information available, information asymmetry, there was more information to the person doing the selling than there was for the person that is being sold to and that's changed a lot. And so the style of how you have to sell has changed. Um, and in order to be successful. And I think we are at this um, intersection uh, now where there's a huge correlation and people want to see that correlation between values and the products that you're selling. Um, you know, and I think, <clears throat> I think Daniel Pink is probably one of my favorite authors in this area um, with a lot of, a lot of the, the works that he's uh, put together selling as human. And, you know, I, I just think that uh, he's probably one of the best well-researched, um, individuals, uh, and, and, but yet writes a book and puts it into, into ways that it's just easily understandable and applicable. So I'd highly recommend anything from Daniel Pink as it relates to social selling. But, um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, I think there is a really, and part of why I've been successful selling, uh, not only as a salesperson within my organization, but selling a vision to investors as a founder of a startup is there is always been a really tight correlation between values and, and what we're selling and how we're going to be successful. And I think that's just, uh, for me, I think social selling is about um, I think social selling is about making, providing everybody that you're interacting with, you're providing them a, a feeling of increase. Uh, you're making them better and you're also making the world better. And I think those three things are really important. I love that. And the baseline, and you said it right off the bat, Dalton, was, you know, social selling is human, right? Yeah. And, and I love that you describe 
we're entering and we are currently in a different landscape than what sales is and what sales was. And you can view it as it's a numbers game. And that's how I viewed it early on. I think when you start to value more of the human in it and fall in love with the process and, and you know, the journey, the experiences, the connections, um, you start to see being a good human and maybe having values and living aligned with them in those can lead to, to quality traits in sales that yes, the psychology and learning how to say certain things um, might be cool and fancy, but it might only increase results two to 3%, right? How you, how you get massive results is being a quality human. And, and like you had said, we're selling every day, right? Whether yeah. you're a salesperson or not, it's not a title. It's, it's the person you're trying to attract. It's the, the job you want to get. It's the investor you're trying to pitch that you know, you've worked five years to try to, you know, get this meeting and you're intimidated as hell. Your hands are sweaty. Mom's yeah. spaghetti is all over your shirt. Um, <laughs> Dalton, what, what is that like on that <clears throat> note when, when we talk about social selling, but in regards to the relationships with wealthy investors in healthcare, um, how, what do they value? What's unique yeah. about the, your investors versus anyone else? What do they need from you? And what's human about you? And why have they chosen you over others? Yeah, I think, I think this is true for a lot of startups is when you're, when you're early on, those investors that are investing in the company are investing in you. There, you know, there's not a whole lot of, a lot of um, v- validity yet in the business model. You might not even know the business model. You might have an idea but you still don't know what's going to make it a scalable business. You're solving a problem that you're passionate about. And I think this is where I go back to the profitability and values being, you know, directly correlated with each other because people are only going to, I mean, starting a company and raising money is selling and you have to get somebody to, you know, pull out their checkbook and and write you, you know, a hundred, 200, $300,000 check that has, that one maybe doesn't know you, uh, there's not a lot of traction. It's an idea. And so how are you going to do that? And I think, I think a lot of founders find themselves really overthinking, uh, really trying to think that they, you know, it's important to do a lot of thinking in terms of how the business is going to work, right? That's important. You have to be able to talk about that. You have to have a good hunch in terms of, you know, why this is a good market opportunity and why they should invest in you. But there's values that I think you, you could have the best business model idea and concept, but if you're not, it, it, people people can pick up on on those values really quick, and I think uh, that's what makes you successful early on because you'll pivot three or four times before you find that winning business model, and and so it, really what it's about you, it's about the people that you can attract and the team that you can attract, and that again goes back to the values of the company, and I think when you're first starting. Uh, it's so important that the problem you're trying to solve is one that you're passionate about, because that's that's how you that's how you take uh, you you and what makes you you your values and you incorporate them into a business. And uh, and I think in order for you to understand who what the company's values should be, you have to understand yourself. And once you can understand the things that you value you can apply those values to a problem. Uh, Then you mold a company around the same values that you have personally. And that allows you to attract other people that share those values. And so that can be investors, early stage investors. It can be, it can be early key employees, Um, but you, you need a team. And I think the way that you attract that early team really early on is less calculated i think than some of the 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 business world and entrepreneurial worlds make it seem it's a little less academic it's a little less calculated than you might expect um it's you you have to think about those things but you almost have to do it knowing that it's going to change but the one thing that should never change is your values and i think um you might make several pivots in the marketplace but they're all around the same you know values those those initial people those initial investors will continue to support you. And I think that that's a, uh, hopefully that answer your question. Yeah, I love it. And, and there's more to unpack, right? It, I, I love it because 
you hit on the you hit on the tone that social selling goes beyond just selling, right? It's the influence that you have with the team and being able to attract investors who might not even know you to an idea, right? And that goes far beyond building rapport um, in that at a high level. And I see it too, that again, it's the human component. We can have all the assessments and have all the data we want, but there's a human component. And I think in the first 25, it's a balance. The first 25 hires for any company, right? They say make or, makes or breaks. And, and usually those first 25, if the company does succeed, earn a lot more than the founders do. Um, but that this same level of social selling is, is influence. And as you were saying this, it, I think it was John Maxwell that talks about leadership is simply the level of influence we have, right? And, and it brought up in a kind of the light bulb moment of, how important our brand and personal brands are with influence. Cause we've been talking about this since we had, you know, our offices next to each other and we could pound on the wall uh, to just make yeah. sure we were both working. Um, I, I love that. I, I, we have never brought that up in social selling, but that is absolutely true. We've never brought that up in an interview. So I'm, I'm loving that. Um, is it okay if, if we, we're going to switch up the topic, we're going to go yeah. rapid fire. So this morning, I know you're back home with family. We're in between the holidays. But today, Dalton, when you woke up, your eyes open, what excited you to get out of bed this morning? Oh, man. Well, uh, you know, I think, I think what I've realized over, the, over the, the years of being in a startup is, and you kind of mentioned, maybe you said this, falling in love with the process. That is that couldn't be more true. Um, I think I've been uh, studying and reading a lot of you know Stoic Stoic writers and Stoic poets, and uh, there's something about Stoicism that I think is as having a resurgence in popularity. Um, and part of it is is I, I try to live. As much as I can, like a like a stoic. In some in some cases, um, you know, there's a time where you just you have to. Uh, there's a time and a place where it's appropriate. And there's a time and place when it's not. You know, if if you're in a board meeting and someone asks you, you know, why the hell are the numbers down this quarter, and you have a stoic response of, you know, seeming seeming somewhat disengaged or or, uh, or, or not thinking it's a big deal or, uh, that there's, that there's, uh, I don't, I don't know. There's a time and place for stoicism, but stoicism is what keeps me sane. And I think when you wake up in the morning and you do the same thing every morning, it's not sexy. It's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily what a lot of, what, what gets talked out about a lot, but like my morning journal is something that is, is fundamentally, uh so important for me um in my headspace but also the company because it forces me to you know i have assimilated through a ton of different <clears throat> books and strategies and uh different journaling techniques and i've kind of landed on assimilation of of several different techniques that i use every morning and i think that's what gets me excited in the morning is is um you know, I get, I, it forces me to be present. So I'll wake up and sometimes I'm, there's things on my mind. I'm thinking about, you know, things that are, you know, already starting st stress. It's not that every day I wake up as a, you know, as, as somebody that's calm and collected and thinks about what I'm grateful for today and constantly living in the present. Um, but when I do my journal, I am. And I think uh, there's a part, so when I journal, I first do first impressions and that's a way to just get whatever's on my mind out on paper. And that can never be anything from like a quote I've been thinking about to just like me rifting on what happened the night before or what I'm excited about or what's troubling me. It's literally whatever comes to mind, I get it out. And usually it's only anywhere from like a, sometimes it's a word, you know, sometimes I'll just like have, a word in mind. Sometimes it's, you know, three pages and it really just kind of depends. And then I dive into gratitude and uh, I do a past, present, future. You know, what's one thing I'm grateful for in my past? What's one thing I'm grateful for in the present? What's one thing I'm grateful for in the future? And that's how I get a little future proofing in. 
in the morning. And, and that, that usually really helps me, um, you know, and I think, uh, I think, uh, there's one thing that I've been thinking a lot about <laughs> is, uh, I, I, one of my business mentors, I'm, I, 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 I find myself impatient sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, because I feel like I know where I want to be in 40 years. And that's, that's a curse in some ways, <clears throat> because that's 40 years away. And, and what can I do today? And, um, and so I was, I was talking to one of my advisors about this and, um, and he goes, Dalton, impatience is just another form of laziness. Impatience, when you're feeling impatient, that's the desire for you to go from point A to point D and skip B and C. <clears throat> so when you feel impatient, tell yourself you're being lazy and to focus on today. Mm. And I tell myself that all the time now. If I'm feeling impatient, if I'm feeling like, ah, you know, ah, you know, if only, ah, you know, and I, 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 th I think, you know, that's just you being lazy. That's you wanting to not do, it's kind of wanting, it's you kind of avoiding the things that need to get done. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's laziness. It's, it's, um, and, and when I tell, and, and I'm not a lazy person. So when I tell myself that I'm being lazy, that really makes me um, say, you know what? No, I'm going to focus on today and I'm going to keep focusing on getting first downs, you know, from a, from a football aspect, it's like, you know, uh, yes, the final score is what matters, um, but at the same time, if you get too caught up on that, uh, it can get away from you. Just keep focusing on getting first downs, and I tell myself that all the time. In business, is like, what can I do today? What what's what's going to get us? What's going to get a first down? How do we stay in the game um, and to give ourselves an opportunity to win? I love it. Ton of value there. And and what's funny is. I actually had this as one of the topics that this was selfish. Selfishly, I put it as last because I wanted to personally bring up. I know that you've been journaling actively for some time. And you and me both love biohacking. We love just accessing happiness, right? And being able to share as much love with the world through our companies, through the people we work with. It, it's, it's fun. Now, I remember clearly when you and me, we, we got into entrepreneurship at pretty much the same time. And it was, it was wild because remember Mike Finlayson introduced us. We were both yeah. hungry and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit about what led up to that. Um, but we both wanted to channel it and we had this impatience like within ourselves and we were investing in ourselves through self-development, but it was like, what's this next step? And then, you know, fast forward, that same passion for self-development continues to accelerate excitement and usually accelerates the, the company's trajectory, right? The, the leaders are, are usually a good indicator of the ripple effect. The rest of the, the company will see, um, so. but you were journaling and you're new to it. And you, you just said, you know, this helps me out. I carry this notebook on me everywhere. And I think at the time it was like a pretty small one. And, um, and I'd see you at times writing it all the time. And, and I was like, oh, okay, whatever. And I'd, I'd read a couple more self-development books, watch some YouTube videos over, over the next few months. And I'd realize, oh, it seems like a lot of successful people are doing that, right? So it's like, okay, Dalton's onto something. And, and I started doing it, but it wasn't something I could actively do consistently. And I'm, I'm happy to be able to share that now it's, it's been over the past year, it's been more consistent than ever before. Um, so I love that you dive into it. And then you answer my question because I wanted to dive into what those techniques were when you journal. Um, we have a lot of similarities there. For me, I do it before bed and it's, it's kind of the outlet getting out of my mind. I like it for you because you're using it as a primer for the morning. So are you rolling out of bed doing that first, first thing? Yeah. So journal is number one. Yeah. So I, I have a, um, <clears throat> there's, it depends, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm a morning person. And this is also goes into uh, when the, the, it's a book called when I think Danny Pink also writes that book. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lark. So I get up early in the morning and that's my, that's my, that's where I have um, kind of my cognitive peak. And so for me, journaling in the morning is really important um, and is something that I feel you know, awake and ready to do every morning. And I, I think there's also another thing, uh, you know, people try to build habits and I, I, I've been more and more into this. Uh, there's, there's definitely 
uh, the, the weekends, I, I still do it. And I think that's really key is because you do it every single day and whether you're working or you're not, it's something that you do every day. And, um, and it, and it helps not only with my relationships within, within the business, but also my personal relationships. And so it is something that I, you know, I, I do every morning. Um, then on Mondays, there's a part of my journal that include the three rocks for the week. That's just about, okay, what, what, um, what are the most, if I don't get anything else done this week, what are the three, one to three things that are critical. And I'll, I'll mark those down at the top of, of my journal. Um, and then I have, you know, every, every Monday, or actually it's usually Sunday, I'll print out, you know, five or six pages of my journal. I'll put them in. So I get ready for the week. Right. So there's the, there's the, the weekly planning <clears throat> and, and that takes, I mean, that's, that, that, that forces you to think a little bit about, um, you know, what, what you're going to work on this week. Uh, and I think that's really important to step out of the whirlwind of the day to day and, and to kind of think about what is most important for me to do this week. Not working, not working in it, not working in the business, but on the business, right? The 80, 20 rule of that, that as founders, especially. Correct. Yeah. Critical. And then there's a time box part of my journal where I time box my entire day. And sometimes I'm really good at it. Sometimes it, you know, there, it falls away from me a little bit, but certainly I always go through my day. Part of it's just to make sure I don't forget what meetings I have coming up and that I prepare um, accordingly. But, but the other part of it is just if I have, okay, one of my big things this week is to publish a finalized Series A slide deck. Okay, well, I know that's something I need to spend some deep work on. I know because I, I read the book when that my personal cognitive peak uh, around uh, my analytical peak is in the morning, um, approximately from seven to nine a.m. And so that's when I'll put in a lot of deep work that focus that that requires a lot of. So it's not my creative peak. I have a creative peak after lunch around around two thirty to four. That's where I, I'm most creative. That's also when I'm best in a team environment. Um, so I'll save a lot of my internal team meetings for around that time, um, and some of my more creative work around that time. Um, I try to do nothing over noon. That's my slump. Uh, I eat lunch and I meditate during my slumps because I know that, you know, I could take a meeting during that time, but it's not necessarily always my peak. Um, and so I'm going to be a little bit slower. Um, I'm not going to perform as well. So there's these timing is everything. Timing is huge. Um, so that that's incorporated into, into my journal. Um, and so I kind of map out my day, what meetings I have. If there's something really important, I time box it in and that makes it, that holds me accountable to say, okay, especially from working from home when I've got a ton of time, it's like time boxing is so important for me, you know, Hey, two to three, I'm working on this. And, um, and then, and then on, and then there is a, a reflection scorecard. So, and this is something that I do really well for a while. And then sometimes I don't do it, but it is insightful data where I have at the bottom, you know, four or five habits I'm trying to, to do drink 72 ounces or more of water, meditate, at least meditate or yoga or some form of meditation, uh, Qigong, I, I, I switch it up. Um, some sort of physical meditative, you know, meditation, or I, I, I can, I, my kind of yoga and my kind of Qigong and Tai Chi is less physical exercise, more mental. Um, and, and so uh, I, I do, when I do yoga, it's very slow. It's very, it's, it's a form of meditation for me. So I, I have to get an hour of that in. Uh, and that is so critical uh, for, for me and my sanity is some sort of, and, and there'll be days where I'm like, I don't want to, I'm too busy to meditate, you know, and, and I'm always glad when after that I did it. And so there's like habits like that I'm trying to do. And then there's like these, like, who does Dalton want to be like my values, right? And I have this little value scorecard was like, did I leave an impression of increase with every, <clears throat> everyone I interact with today? And that's just something that I've always told myself, like, <clears throat> when I'm, when I met with somebody, did, did I inspire them? Did they come, aw come away with, from the interaction having learned something and or valued the interaction? <clears throat> so 
providing a level of increase. There's, um, did I become, was I like a, a leader today? And there's a, so on my habit, it's either yes, no, I did it or I didn't. <clears throat> on the values, it's a one through five. So how did I do on that? <clears throat> you know, how, how did I learn? Did I, did I attain new management skills today? Did I self-educate? You know, one through five. And then I'll tally up that score. <clears throat> and I and I do like a you know a, a, in my particular scorecard there's a total of like uh, 25 points a perfect day is 25 points and and I'll just see okay where where was I and 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 I'll try to do and that's kind of how I end the day and and I'm an athlete so I'm competitive and I try not to be competitive because I'd rather be creative not competitive um, but uh, those are oh today was a was a 20 out of 25, you know, um, and I'll, I'll track that. Excuse me. <clears throat> I love it, man. And, and <clears throat> you're very disciplined. I love it. And you know that to optimize and to better these things, you have to track it. Right. And as humans, we love pattern recognition and when yeah, we start to it, it's hard, levels, right? And that's, it helps. It's a lot of work. And that's why it's, it's not for me, something that I end up doing every single day. Sometimes I forget. Sometimes I just don't have the time. Sometimes I just don't want to do it. But I notice that when I'm doing it consistently, I can I can compare the results. Uh, and that's the other thing. You know, how do you know? You might be spending a lot of time like, hey, I need to run an hour a day or something, right? You might think you have a habit. You, you have something that you want to do that's going to be important for your performance. But until you measure it, how do you really know if it's going to help you? You know, you might have picked it up somewhere that, you know, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos, you know, does like, you know, an hour of hot yoga every day. I mean, I'm just making this up. I have no idea what he does. But, you know, OK, now I'm going to do an hour of hot yoga because that's going to make me Jeff Bezos. And you might realize that doing an hour of hot yoga is not what makes you is not what helps you. So until you track with those habits and, and, and are they really if I do them consistently, is it producing results? How do you know? So that's how I thought of it when I kind of first did my scorecard is how do I keep myself accountable? But then how do I know that <clears throat> the habits I'm spending so much time to form are actually good for me? Um, and, uh, and so anyway, that I think tracking your performance and then in, 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 as a CEO, tracking performance is difficult in some ways. You know, I think uh, you, you mentioned it already, you know, the puck starts and stops with you as a CEO, founder with the company. And, uh, and so I'll just look, you know, was it a good quarter? And then how many times, you, you know, did I, in terms of a good quarter, you know, ARR, you know, uh, did, did we increase AR? You know, we have like probably 10 SaaS metrics that we track. The biggest one is revenue right now at our stage. And was it a good quarter? And then if I reflect on that quarter, I should be able to look at my journal and was I scoring high day to day? And, and what are the things that always get missed like out of my habits? Like maybe that's just something I shouldn't be doing um, or maybe I, should, maybe I should change it, so. Yeah, and I think the very easy kind of filter too, similar to why, why we use values because they're filters, right? Um, the filter here is sustainability right? Can I be doing this? You know, I can do it today. I can do it this week, but you know, I could go on a keto diet, but realistically, can I be doing this three months down the road? Am I able to implement and kind of create this into a lifestyle and, and viewing this with all these other things we're talking about, right? Um, not only valuing the analytical of was I productive today? Now I know that's something you and me like, but a couple of things you mentioned, and this is where the journaling comes in is you're checking in on how you're feeling too, right? And I, and that's the other important factor here. And that's also what, what happens when you're practicing different forms of presence, right? Whether there's movement involved in, in yoga and Tai Chi or, or it's not, and it's meditation, more mental focus. Now, Dalton, what was unique about your childhood? Name three things that were unique about your childhood. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I think my parents, I mean, my, my mom, especially, um, She's probably one of the most demanding slash competitive people that I've ever met in my entire life and um, to a fault. And I think, uh, I think that's, that's um, it gave me an edge and 
as much as being hyper competitive is toxic sometimes in the business world there's there's also times where that grit makes all the difference in the world and so i think that that uh that shaped me and and that was pretty unique um let's see uh so we got one there uh, yeah name name like one or two more yeah what a, um what a, what allowed you I'm, I'm assuming in your childhood, you as an athlete, I'm not sure what sport, but, or maybe it was just year round. How did that, was there anything unique about you as an athlete? Yeah. You know, I think, it, I think, um, you know, with, whether it be individual sports or team sports, I think being an athlete, it, there's always a clear measure of your performance. And if you want to do better next time, you gotta, you have to get better. And if you want to win, you've got to earn the right to win. And so I think that always, that, that, that for me, I think being an athlete gave me a lot of sense of um, ownership. And I think that ownership is really important um, in business and in life. What, what sport, I know, I know you continue to play football after high school, but was that from an early age, was that your, your favorite sport? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it started to become a bigger, yeah. Football was always huge in my family. You know, when I was born, I was blessed to the football gods. My grandpa took me out in the middle of the football field. I mean, it was like our, you know, where we were nuts about football. It's changed a little bit since after my accident, actually. But um, yeah, football was always huge uh, track. Um, what was what was your dream? What was your first dream? Do you, what was your biggest dream once you were a freshman? You, so so describe how bad did you want that feeling? Like really put yourself back in that. Like what? Yeah. How bad did you I mean, want to be in the NFL? What were you willing to give it, up? everything yeah that was that i think that that was my north star for since i was a little kid your Is first dream to, like the first one that you took consistent yeah calculated yeah, 100 be be in the nfl you know and i and i think i i um i naturally just i mean i remember i remember people i had a lot of respect for my grandpa who was a football coach and and uh announcer and analyst and like he really knew football uh, well. And, uh, you know, I remember him saying, you know, what, what do you want to, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to play in the NFL. And he was kind of like, yeah, you know, like that's not a very, you know, likely outcome, you know, you should, you should. and I, and I never really thought about it like that. I was just kind of new, like, I'm going to go play in the NFL. I mean, period. Like, that's just, it, it's not if it's just, it's just a matter of being consistent and patient <clears throat> and, and keeping myself in the game, keeping myself, they have the opportunity to eventually do it. So, yeah, there was every, and everything I did was around that. I mean, from, the, I mean, even growing up as a little kid, you know, I have, I'd have my favorite players, you know, that I idolized, you know, posted all over my room and I'd have a Lombardi trophy because I wanted to win a Super Bowl. I didn't want to just go in if I wanted to win a Super Bowl. And I think, I think I had, just from a little kid, I've always had these vision boards and surrounded myself with people that, um, you know, had done it and I wanted to do it. And I, and I would copy and model myself after these, uh, athletes, you know, anything that they did. I mean, I remember Tyler Sash, um, God bless him. He, uh, he was from my hometown and, uh, and, you know, I, I remember him playing high school football and, and then into and then had an amazing career at Iowa and then in the NFL. And I remember just anything, anything he would do, I would, I would do it. You know, I would, I would just absorb it. And I would watch him. I mean, from the how he drank the water out of the water ball, out of the water, out of the water bottle to like how he walked or how he held his, you know, how he stood on the sidelines and held his helmet. Like my everything myopically detailed, I would copy. Um, and I think that's what made me a good athlete too, is because I was just like, you know, I wasn't the most talented, but I was a really good copier. Like I would just watch somebody and copy it until I got it nailed down. So I would surround myself with the best athletes or model people, you, you know, how I would want to play. And I would just try to copy and analyze everything. Like when I was at Iowa and unfortunately I got injured early due to an accident, but Chad Greenway, 
was my guy. Like I, I, everything about how he played when he was at Iowa, I would just watch tons of film on Chad Greenway and I would try to do things he would do. And I think that was just, I, I um, yeah. Damn. I love it. And I could feel it, man. I could feel it. And, and with that, I'm going to fill in the gap and bridge it. You were definitely, my guess is from small town, you were definitely well-known and then to get an offer, you know, multiple offers, but then to go to play and, and become a Hawkeye and play division one football. And, you know, you were a linebacker and what's wild is I, I don't think I ever met you. We didn't meet until after, you know, what right. we're about to dive into. So, and I really wanted to set it up so people understood the context for how much you want it. Your life was dedicated to it. And there's a few athletes out there. One thing that I love that you mentioned that separates you and me is, you know, I was a quarterback. My dream was to play in the NFL, but my dream was not to win a Super Bowl. And that is just that little, that little, it seems so minuscule, but I see how much gravity that can hold. It's a whole nother level of how you're going to show up in the gym and, and how you're going to show up because how we do anything is how we do everything. Right. Um, can we talk about, you know, so you, you get onto the team at the university of Iowa. What, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that feeling was unreal. You've yeah. Just lead us up to, to the day you're, you're on the team, you've gained the weight. And then what happens this day that, that ends up changing your life? Um, well, I mean, I remember I, so it was about, I was like, I remember <clears throat> getting the, um, I was a walk on. So I, I always had a chip on my shoulder going in. I remember getting uh, kind of the preferred walk on option. I was, it was I was lifting weights um, really early in the morning at my Oskaloosa, you know, our, our gym and my head coach at the time came over to me. He's like, you wouldn't believe who I was just on the phone with, um, you know, it's Iowa and they want you to come to, you know, they want you to be a, a preferred walk on. And at the time I was considering a couple other schools where I had full rides that were smaller schools, um, as well as preferred walk on potential scholarship opportunity, at Iowa state. And I was kind of, I, I still didn't really know, but, but then the minute he said it and I got so excited you know, when he said it, even if it was a walk on, I didn't care. It was just like, to me, that was when I got the offer, I realized, okay, that's where I'm going to go. I mean, I, I, I never got as excited as the others, you know, it was an exciting opportunity, but when, when he said it, I just kind of felt like, all right, that's where I want to go. And, um, and so I, I, uh, I, I accepted the offer and I ended up talking or my position coach at the time, LeVar Woods, and inviting me to fall camp, which is usually only for some of the walk-ons, but mostly just the scholarship guys. And, uh, he took a, he took a, a bet on me and invited me to fall camp. And, uh, and, uh, that was, that was really important. And, and so I always felt, um, since day one that, you know, I, I, uh, and this is where it, so I guess it was somewhat surreal, but at the same time, it was like, okay, well now I've, you know, now I'm here, you know, now I need to need to perform. And I, you know, and, and I, and I sometimes, you know, and this is hindsight 2020, not knowing that I was going to be in a, in an accident. I felt like I had time, you know, I was like, okay, I'm a red shirt. Like I've got five years, you know, and, and now I just want to soak up and learn everything, you know, and I, and I was very risk adverse. Like I was very, like, I, I, uh, I was, I was very, I felt like I was holding back a little bit because, because I, I, uh, it, it, but that might just be, you know, now, you know, in having my career end early, I wish I would have just went, you know, balls to the wall from day one, but for me, it was just one of those things where, uh, you know, I, I wanted to soak in everything and I wanted to learn the game. I wanted to study the game. I wanted to be, you know, I, 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 uh, I was very academic about it, I guess. And, uh, and yeah, you know, and I think, I think I learned so much from being at Iowa. You know, I think, um, there's a lot of people that, you know, the coaching staff and other players, you know, I'm still friends with to this day. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think that shaped me into somebody that I had, you know, always had good work ethic because my mom in high school, but that was a, kind of another level um, of responsibility that I, uh, 
that I that I picked up while while at Iowa. Yeah. And what what happened the day? Can you describe the accident just for for anyone? My job is to make sure that Dalton Shaw is on everyone's radar that doesn't know Dalton yet. Um, yeah. But I, I know this is a is just a wild story. Um, and, and this is something that that happened to you. Most people wouldn't live. Yeah. Were you you were leaving practice or headed to a practice? What what happened? Yeah, yeah. in fact, it was. Yeah, you know, I know it's just kind of wild. I had one of the breath, the bet, my one of my best practices ever. You know, it was just one of those days where I was just in flow. And I remember being in flow. I remember being like, you know, you know, several coaches calling out, you know, it was during conditioning. I was just smoking everybody. And I was just like, you know what, like it's time to, it's time to go. You know, it gets time, like enough kind of hold the, you know, and so I just remember having a different mental attitude, which is kind of ironic. I feel like, because I had no idea in about three or four hours, I'd be, um, kind of, uh, on my deathbed, if you will. Um, I left practice. I turned on to, uh, the highway and, um, you know, and that that's the last thing I can remember. I know what happened because of the, the, you know, the reports, but also there was this, um, there's this nurse who's now a good friend that, that saw the whole thing that I met up with afterwards kind of explained to me what happened. And, but yeah, no, I, I woke up in the hospital, um, later that night and, uh, and saw my whole family and everybody's crying. And I was like, man, what the heck happened? I, you know, I had a, I had a number of injuries. I had a rod through my leg because I, I, had, I had shattered the right side of my pelvis. And so there's this big bar sticking through my femur and it, and there's blood everywhere. And uh, there was some doctors working on my head and in my face because I had, I had facial reconstruction on my forehead on my nose. My nose had gotten ripped off. And, and so I definitely could feel a lot of that. I could see it, but I could feel a lot of blood everywhere and a bunch of doctors in your face. And then I, I went to, I remember my mom and being there and um and i went to give her a hug and my arm wouldn't move and that's when i was like okay um i and i thought honestly you know just the drugs or something you know like my arm was just numbed up and i was like i can't yeah i can't move my arm and um i just remember one of the nurses being like well you should be able to like that's kind of weird I'm like, I'm telling you, I can't move it. And so then they took me into scans and they told me that I had torn my brachial plexus and, and that, uh, they didn't really sure know the extent of the nerve damage, but they knew it was enough that I, I had full paralysis. So I couldn't feel it or move it. And, uh, that that's when I kind of, that's when it's really started hitting, you know, that like, okay, like my body's definitely different and, and it, it may always be different. You know, I had a couple of I kept asking and telling people, you know, make sure you tell uh, Coach Doyle and, you know, Ference that I wasn't going to be able to make weights tomorrow morning. You know, I was very concerned about being on time for weights. And, uh, and they're like, oh, no, you're, you're good, dude. They're like, you know, we, we, you know, and, and actually Coach Ference and Doyle and everybody came to the hospital. But, um, you know, I think uh, for me, it was just kind of one of those things like, I'll be back you know, this is just kind of a momentary, you know, like, you know, setback, but you know, that's what makes you stronger and I'll be back watch. And, um, and then that's when the doctors were like, yeah, you know, like you'll be lucky to like run normally again, you know, and your hips pretty messed up and, you know, who knows, I mean, your arm, you know, who knows if that, that, that could never come back. And that's when I was like, all right, that's, uh, that, that, that to me was kind of, um, and, and then I think the other thing that really set it in is like all of my teammates coming in and just seeing them cry when they saw me. That's when I knew it was bad, but. Damn, damn, man. And I remember when we were together and you showed me like from the reports, like what had happened and, and what, oh, yeah. what they explained and you, you know, someone hitting their brakes and you're on your moped which every iowa yeah. athlete i feel like is riding yeah. and you went through the back window of like a van yes. and your shoulder hit the steel like beam yeah. of, of a vehicle and and so 
Um, not not to go into any more detail, but it's it's such a low point, and and it's an, it's. I love that you can share it with the conviction, the confidence, and and see it for for what it is and how it's built you. That it, it really was a growth opportunity, and and um, in future interviews, I'd love to dive into that more because yeah. just now I remember some of the thoughts when you were really really low, and I don't I know we don't have time today, but I'd love to <laughs> dive into those and like this is this has all gone into what has created, you know, the Dalton today and, and how you've been able to channel it to, to social selling and, and leading a company, you know, Omni Life and, and you and Eric and, and the rest of the team and doing, yeah. you know, real awesome work. And what is, what are you most excited for, for Omni Life going into 2022? Oh man. Um, perfect market, perfect team, perfect product. Uh, you know, kind of all these things, all this hard work over the past five or six years are really starting to come together. So <clears throat> a lot of growth. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I think it's just a stepping stone, you know, for, for what OmniLife could be, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a care coordination communication platform now, but, you know, the future of whether it be OmniLife or another company is the future is, is really being a, a platform for transplant 2.0, um, the transplant of the future where, you know, the, the, the entire system of donation and transplantation isn't centered around a donor, but it's centered around, centered around regenerative medicine. It's centered around personalized medicine where we'll be growing organs for people. And there will need to be a platform that matches and, and is basically the amazon.com for engineered organs and tissues. And that's what, you know, I want to, I want to be part of, that's what I want to do. Um, so, you know, I know that the, right. Yeah. So what I'm excited about for 2022 is rocket ship growth, you know, doing a series a putting some serious money into the company to further grow it is all on the, you know, in plans for, for 2022. Um, but just knowing that we're building something that is so much bigger too, uh, at the same time and being patient for that next part of, uh, of, of the, 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 the life cycle of Omni Life, or, or if that's another company, you know, whatever the future holds, that's, that's something we're working towards is, is we have a really big vision. I love it. And I know you do. And I know you guys have the work ethic to go, go along with it. Do you have one more book recommendation that, that really excites you or, or anyone, any of the social seller listeners oh, that you'd man. recommend? Oh, that's a tough question. I have so many books. I, and, I and I'll love. let you think about it for a second. Cause for anyone else that that wants to, you know, learn more about you, Dalton, wants to maybe learn more about Omni Life, and I heard through yeah. the grapevine that that you guys are hiring some some talent. So anyone that, yeah, that might always. relate in this interview, definitely reach out. But where's the best place for people to to learn more about you and Omni Life? Uh, just my LinkedIn for now. Uh, you can also go to our website and again OmniLife.com. But hit me up on LinkedIn, and I'll make sure to add that your LinkedIn profile along with Omni Life's website down below. And then on that book recommendation, what's a yeah. book that can really kickstart 2022 for, for social sellers around the world? Yeah, man. Um, you know, I, there's always the classic that I read every year. And I think when, there, when it's the new year, I like to read it around this time, but that's a classic seven habits of highly effective people. That book uh, continues to be, a book that every time I learn it, uh, open it up, I learn something about myself um, that I didn't know. Um, you know, and another one I'm reading right now that was really inspiring for me as a CEO, uh, it was uh, was uh, Onward, Howard Schultz's uh, book on Starbucks. And I think the reason that I, and, and it's probably not for everyone, it's fairly long, uh, but I really try to model my leadership style after Dr., uh, 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 Howard Schultz. And he's just a leader that I have a lot of respect for and uh and kind of he was kind of had the steve jobs scenario where he started something and then left and was actually forced out and then came back and turned starbucks around into what it is today and i think that uh any entrepreneur that kind of goes through that where you know they're kind of you know they they start something but then you know they they run into roadblocks and uh and they're and they're kind of facing the the end of of the company and they need to really come around and, and step it up and, and kind of lead transformation and, and continue to, uh, 
you know, push the company forward, I, I have a lot of respect for. And, uh, and so just, his, and he's, and he is a social seller as well. I mean, he, he, uh, he kind of pioneered a lot of things at Starbucks that were really environmentally focused, social impact focused, and, um, you know, leaders that, uh, that are able to balance profitability with values is, is, is a, a leader that I always respect. And so I think Howard Schultz is a perfect example of that. I love that. And I, you've piqued my curiosity. I, I want to look more into him. I did not realize that he, he left and came back. And in that, that tone, I just want to make a point. I realize as I get older and I, I love business and I'm falling more and more in love with the process and the journey because it never used to make sense to me a few years ago. Like even though I'd read it, I, it didn't make sense. But one thing you had said was um, it, it, it reminds me of how it's almost notches on the belt going through adversity that I almost seem to respect, whether it's in business or life, people that have gone through adversity, because it's, it's all growth opportunities. So from an accident and being able to come back from it, from a company that goes bankrupt, like it's, it's our lens as individuals and social sellers to determine, is this going to be the end for me? Am I giving up on life? No, you know, the, the people that are listening in, you know, we are not, we are creating a life that we're excited to wake up for. And Dalton, thank you again for hopping in. Um, in seven Ooh. habits of highly success or highly successful, uh, what is it? highly successful individuals? Uh, uh, seven people, seven habits of highly effective people. Okay. And then I also want to get win because I read seven habits, but it's probably back in college. So I, that is yeah. definitely seven habits is one win. seven habits. You, you got to pick that up at least once a year. Um, I love and, that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and when that's, that's the really insightful book too, because he helps you try to figure out what your peaks and troughs are and you can model your day about or around those peaks and troughs. And, and it also, uh, if you know the people you work with the most and their peaks and troughs, you can better, you can, you can, you can work better as a team. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it really can make huge, such a small thing that can have huge, huge, uh, uh, effects on outcomes is, is is knowing when you're at your analytical peak or at your creative peak or when you're in a trough and modeling your day around that um it increases results i love it i love it i'm picking both up today so i'll order them dalton i appreciate you brother and uh we'll see you on the inside for anyone else uh be sure to subscribe below to make sure you get more of this value every single week we're uploading new interviews providing more value not only with other business owners, social sellers, but Chris will continue to be uploading more content around the how-tos and our relationship with LinkedIn and partnership with HubSpot and what we're doing to actually help companies, solopreneurs to Fortune 500 turn opportunities into to long-term growth. So thanks again, Dalton. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Bye. This is awesome, man.